from Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. We wanted to round out Women's History Month with an episode that takes a harder look at the state of women in the healthcare industry. Although there are more women in the healthcare industry overall, few women and women of color advance to senior leadership positions. So today, I want to talk about the steps that organizations can take to change that. To do that, I've brought Erica Joy Daniels, the SVP and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Advocate Aurora. Hey, Erica Joy. Hello. How are you, Rachel? I am excellent, but you know, you can call me Ray. That's what everybody calls me here, so feel free to. I can? Okay. If I get a pass, I'm going for it. Yep. (laughs) Have you ever been on a podcast before? I have, um, all health related. So I'm kind of excited about this is still healthcare, but it's kind of getting a little bit more personal and close to home. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, well, I love it when we get a seasoned veteran on the podcast, not least of all because it makes the equipment and the recording process a little <laughs> bit easier. We are talking about women in leadership in healthcare, and I'm Mm -hmm. cognizant of the fact that you are a woman and a leader at your organization. I sort of want to start by kicking things over to you. What has your personal experience been like, particularly as as a Black woman in the healthcare space? Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, most of my career, I've either been the youngest or the only only female or the only mm-hmm. person of color and developing that muscle to kind of trudge through and drive forward. In healthcare, there's something a little bit different, I think, being in a purpose-driven environment. Um, but I still recognize the challenges um, that are faced with being um, one of not that many, right? And um, uh, representing myself without trying to have to represent all who look like me or have mm. background like me. Um, that that's a weight that I try not to carry, but a, a responsibility that I do feel like I need to pay attention to. And you've already mentioned kind of a, a red flag that I think we'll, we will warn our audience of, which is asking people to carry the weight of all people who look like them or who identify yeah. as them. And that's where I want to go next. Before we talk about kind of the right answers when it comes to workforce diversity and inclusion, I am willing to bet that there are some myths or misconceptions that you want to bust from the start. What do most folks get wrong when they think about workforce DEI? Hmm, that is just about Black people. <laughs> uh, when it, you know, or it's about we we create labels quickly around the underserved and the under 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 this under that, right? Mm. And it it can lead to this conception that it means less than, you know. You're right. Well, if we're going to conclude, you know, more diversity, we'll, we'll take a chance on folks. Well, really, any hire you make, you're taking a chance on unless you personally know them, you know, or we're going to lower our standards. Those are absolutely not the same criteria. We, we don't want to reduce excellence. We don't want to lower standards or lower any bars. It's just about getting the fair share of talent who come from amazingly different packages into the organization. And I think those are really important for leaders to understand. Yeah, that's such an important one. I I will admit to you that I got that pushback, I'm not kidding, a few days ago um, when it came to the same conversation about women in leadership and and somebody kind of had the concern of how – I think their question was, how do we balance elevating women to leadership positions and giving them positions that they aren't prepared for or aren't ready for? And my instinct Mm. was, this is not a problem. Uh, (laughs) This is this is not the problem that you think it is. Preparation's not the issue, (laughs) right? What would you have said to that person? I would have, you know, I sometimes I try to come from a place of curiosity if I can hold back, you know, if I can restrain some of my concern or frustration. But it's what what makes you think that they're not prepared? Yeah. Or how do you define preparation? Because I think women have have had experience in ridiculously amazing places that have led to a preparation that some people just couldn't touch. 
And sometimes it's that's missed. Yeah. And it's exactly to the, the point you made earlier, which is that creating a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace is not about elevating people who aren't prepared or giving somebody the shot, right? Like you said, that right. is that is not the purpose at all. It's about creating systems and structures that are equitable to all and not prioritizing one group over another. Yeah. Yeah. And, and finding what's missing from the organization. You know, it's why I also get uncomfortable when people say, well, what about diversity of thought? There, There is there is diversity of thought, but guess what? The diversity of my thought comes because of the diverse package I'm in. Mm. You know, my background, my cultural awareness, my, my, my understanding, my lived experience is what contributes to my diversity of thought. And so let's go there and not slip into the, you know, slippery place of, well, all we really need is diversity of thought. You, the thought comes from the package and from the experience. Are there other red flags that you've experienced or you've you know heard from other organizations that that you want our listeners to be aware of when it comes to to this initiative? Yeah, I think it's understanding what people have um, that they bring, even if it's not your experience. So, for example, there may be associations that a person of color is a part of, and just because you haven't heard of it, it doesn't mean that it's not powerful. Or fully understanding when someone says, you know, I have this collateral duty or I've got this um, community involvement, this leadership, you know, instead of making the assumption, ask more questions, be, be curious and understand what does someone have to bring to bear. The other thing, too, is I, I get uncomfortable when people share that someone doesn't fit in the organization. Mm. If we're not careful and dig deep into that, fit can be used as an easy answer to to address what's difference, being a part of a culture, being a part of an environment. And um, some things that may seemingly, quote unquote, not fit may be the best fit for what we need. Do you want to know the, one of my favorite pieces of advice I've ever been given when it came to mm -hmm. my own hiring practice? And I'm curious to see if you agree with this. Sure. Okay. The advice was, don't assume that the right person to hire is the person who is the most like you. Oh, absolutely. Which reminds me exactly <laughs> what you said of like, this person maybe doesn't fit. That if you're just looking for somebody else reflected in yourself or looking for yourself reflected in a candidate, you are immediately going to operate with bias. And that kind Absolutely. of reminds me of your fit comment. Yep. And you'll miss something. I mean, think about this. In processes and efficiencies, we want to remove redundancy, right? So then why are we redundant in our talent selection? You know what I mean? Oh, wow. Like when I staff a team, I look for what's missing. Like, what do I not have? Like, it's like, you know, baking a, a cake and what ingredient do I not yet have that can make this even more amazing? Every person on my team, I found their attributes that I don't have. And I'm excited about it because I think it just blends and makes something even more amazing. I love that so much. Okay, let's talk about Advocate Aurora specifically. I find that there's kind of two ways to think about uh, – you know, equitable strategies in general, especially when it comes to something like DEI. And there are the programs that organizations put in place and also the kind of structural changes that they embed throughout the organization. Let's start by talking about the programs. What efforts at Advocate Aurora have had the biggest impact in advancing women and women of color in leadership? Yeah, we we um, I'll back up a little bit too, right? Because one of the things that really grounds us to even get to designing the best programs that can get the best results mm -hmm. is having the best data, you know? Yeah. Because we we need to understand what are we programming to solve, what are we trying to address, what gaps are we trying to close, and what are we really aiming to make a difference of? Yeah, let, let's go into the data piece first. What are the missing pieces of the puzzle that you need to even determine what the right programs or structures you need to put in place are? Absolutely. So, Ray, I think, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, equity is really about closing gaps. So you got to know what those gaps actually are. And your data tells you exactly what that means, um, because your data becomes a roadmap. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. your it's your instructions, you know, turn left here, turn right here, meander here, because this is the place we need to address. And so looking at the data that already exists in the business and stratifying it by dimensions of diversity, whether we're looking at things like race and ethnicity, or we're looking at age or gender or tenure, let's get a really micro level um, view of what we have and what we don't have. Then you create the programs to address those specific gaps. So what data would you consider essential to informing these strategies? 
Absolutely. So if you're looking at your representation, you've got to know who you have and who you don't have. So on the inside of the house, you look at your data and your workforce and you can estimate. You can look by levels, by geography, by markets, by site, by business, by function. Break your workforce composition down by race and ethnicity. Break it Mm -hmm. down by gender and get your proportionate numbers to understand what percentage of my population comes from a certain background. And then on the outside, you'll look and see what's available in the marketplace. So those are continue to be the gaps that you can assess to address. I appreciate your push towards specificity here because I I get afraid sometimes when it comes to data that that truthfully data can tell you the story that you want it to tell. And I get worried with organizations that are, are kind of just focusing on this problem now that they're being too broad in how they cut the data. I mean, frankly, so it doesn't look as bad. As an example, I I hear a lot of organizations lumping all people of color together Mm -hmm. when they're assessing Mm -hmm. their DEI efforts thus far. And what I'm hearing you say is that doing so is, is maybe not the right answer. You've got to get to be a little bit more specific. Yes, yes, you should. And people of color may end up being your full category if you've identified who's included in that label, hmm. right? <laughs> if if you understand that the makeup of a number of different dimensions of diversity all have opportunities for improvement, and then you say collectively we will work on them, but there, you can't have one size fits all strategies. Yeah, I mean, I I, I can't I can't go and, and connect with a Hispanic Latino community organization and expect to find an individual who's from the Hmong community, right? Mm, so mm-hmm. so I I need to understand where my needs are so that I can also understand who I'm partnering with, what um, information is needed, and what ideas can be brought out from those groups to help me to co-design for solutions. Mm-hmm. So beyond having the internal data of what you have and where your gaps are, are there other pieces of data that you would encourage folks to look for? Again, if we're thinking about advancing women and women of color into leadership positions, beyond understanding what you have, are there other critical pieces of information that you need to inform that strategy? Yeah, I would say almost figure out what are your... I'll say in healthcare terms, your vital signs of what makes your workforce go well, right? And those are things like our promotion, our turnover, our retention. You can even look at, um, there's research that shows that how long someone's been sitting in a position, you know, if their time and position is lagging and it's, and it's lingering and they can't seem to move up, all of those points we can look at. But then again, micro view, always stratified and understand it. Because if they're sitting in the position too long, they're maybe likely to leave and not advance to the to the level of leadership or senior leadership that we want them to get to. Absolutely. And they potentially have been overlooked. A lot of promotions and advancements or connections can happen because of familiarity. And if you're not in someone's purview or their proximity, you, they, you may not be up for consideration or aware of the next opportunity or your skills and abilities shining for someone else to say, have you seen Ray? Like, do you know what Ray can do? We need to pull her into this project. And then that project becomes a promotion. That promotion becomes, you know, career advancement. So the I love that you call them vital signs. And I'm totally going to shamelessly steal that because I think that makes sense <laughs> for the healthcare community. So the vital signs we need to be looking at are promotion, turnover, time in position. What else am I missing? Yeah. Engagement. Ah, um, and here's the one. thing. They're not they're not singularly diversity measures. Those are measures that matter to any CHRO, any chief human resource officer, any organization that wants to have a good pulse of understanding of their bench, of their workforce, of, yeah. of the people that make their engine work. It's just a matter of looking at it through an equity lens. So now let's apply that data to the strategy. And that brings me back to programs. Uh, I think that some programmatic responses get a bad rap, but but they do have their place when they are tied to specific goals. So when it comes to this kind of intersectional approach to advancing women into senior leadership roles, what programs have you seen or have you implemented that have been the most successful? Yeah. You know, if I go back in time, we had a program at one time um, that was called the Chance Program. And it was a way for us to get team members of color who had higher degrees, in fact, ones that we supported uh, through our tuition reimbursement program, hmm. who were lingering in their roles just to get exposure. They, they just needed exposure and a view on, on who they were. 
And um, we put them in some cross-functional, higher level visibility projects where leaders got to see like, where have you been? You know, it, it was it was just it was just the chance for visibility, and that that served us well. Wait, this is so interesting to me because I think most organizations at this point have something akin to a women in leadership program. But when I think about the way that they mm-hmm. they bring in women into those programs, right? Limited number of seats is that they probably just ask managers for recommendations, and a handful of people are elevated into that program. But to come back to data, it sounds like that's not how this happened. And instead, you looked at time and seat and tried to identify who are people who could potentially benefit the most from this program Mm -hmm. and started there. Yes, yes, yes. And and beyond the program, it becoming a practice, you know, being very intentional in um, our talent review. Like, do we have everyone on our radar, right? In our succession planning. Like who's really been estimated and identified as a high potential that could really rise and shine? Even informal mentoring. How do we get more leaders to spend time with individuals that they otherwise may never have crossed their paths just to get that awareness? Hmm. hmm. Are there other programs that you're particularly proud of that have made a big impact beyond the chance program? Yes, we have a number of leadership development programs that I'm really proud of us that we have integrated Um, leading inclusively into the framework of how we're developing leaders to drive. Also, the selection of individuals that go into those leadership development programs is very intentional, methodical to make sure that we are covering our bases and ensuring that all people are are on our radar. What, What is the process? We are able to scan through our talent review process, our high potential leaders, And there's honest, candid conversation to challenge leaders to say, are you looking at your succession plans like you would look at a a recruitment slate? Are you seeing diversity? And if you don't see diversity, maybe we should inquire within and see who's missing. Or having leaders share names with each other and and have greater conversations so that people can connect across areas of the business. And it does because you don't have to be a high potential leader identified in finance and be missed if you're working in operations, right? Hmm. So having leaders who run our talent review discussions to have cross-functional conversations really helps that. Hmm. Again, I kind of want to come back to misconceptions and myths. Uh, we know that okay. programs can't solve this alone, and we'll get to this, the structural changes in a moment, but having led successful programs, is there advice you would give to listeners of this podcast on what to avoid about the programs that maybe aren't so successful? You know, I might connect that back to the data, Ray, that not only should you collect the quantitative measurable metrics, but the qualitative data and getting insight from the individuals you're looking to to benefit. You know, people who we're trying to support can tell us a whole lot about what works and doesn't work well for them, right? Hmm. Or what they're looking for. And so I think that there's nothing wrong with getting insight from those who you want to serve to prepare to serve them best. Uh, another, you know, kind of practice we have is we have a DEI reactor panel and we have a cross-functional team of leaders that we run these programs and concepts by and they give us great real-time um, feedback and, and connection and insight so that we're not creating anything in a bubble or in isolation. Um, that's been phenomenal. And then it also enables us to get the word on the things that we're doing out there and into operations and, and into the field and at, at the hospitals, because people, people are speaking about the things that they've been pulled into, where their voices mattered and where they've contributed. Hmm. You know, Ray, there's one more program I would bring up because even being in the organization, the intentionality that we've had when we're recruiting talent Um, We recognize that someone coming in blindly into an organization, they may have questions or may, we don't want them to stumble, you know, of orienting themselves to the organization. We created an ambassador program where uh, individuals from diverse backgrounds are paired with an ambassador. It doesn't have to mean a one for one. Like if I'm a black woman, I don't have to initially have to get a black woman, but I get someone from this pool of ambassadors who are identified as, as inclusive leaders. And they help me navigate, navigate the organization. And if I've moved, it could be as simple as something to navigate in the community. Like, oh, wow. I, I can't go to, um, I don't want to give product placement, to, but to every haircut every place, right? <laughs> <laughs> to get my hair done. I, as African-American woman, 
I need a good stylist, you yeah. know? So I might be going into a geography where I need someone to connect me or where to connect my kids or what community organizations can I be a part of? And that has served us well as well. I love that example because we know that it can be especially hard to recruit at the senior leadership level, right? Because you're yes. bringing in somebody from another organization who doesn't quite know the ins and outs and the culture, et cetera. And it's kind of a good reminder that that can be that much more difficult maybe is the, the, the phrase I'm trying to say yes. uh, for certain groups of people. So in order to make the transition easier, have something like an ambassador program. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. COVID-19 vaccine updates are coming at us fast and furious. Let us help you focus on the most important headlines, make sense of them for your organization and patients, and maximize the success of your vaccine initiatives. Visit advisory.com slash COVID-19 for resources focused on your vaccine acceptance and administration and for other tools designed to support you in the ongoing battle against COVID-19. I want to talk about the kind of structural changes because as as beneficial as these individual programs are, we also know that if we're going to make real change at the senior leadership level, we have to address the policies and the processes and the systems that we actually have in place. Again, I'm going to ask you what changes have had the most impact when it comes to these structural changes? Absolutely. It it was really important for us to take a hard, fast, candid look at what, what are we doing to contribute to any um, um, disparate outcomes? What, what, are, what, what inequities do we own, you know, hmm. that we're responsible for paying attention to? And I think just alone having more crucial, candid conversations so the leaders say, we need to even have a decision filter that we look at our approaches through and then identify, let's, let's, it's one thing we signed some external commitments, right? Which a lot of people did in 2020 and sure. we pledged to do this, but we're like that, that's, that pledge only makes a difference if we're actually making the changes inside. And we committed to reviewing policies, um, to a number of policies that we would review and revise appropriately. One example was our um, code of conduct. Does our code of conduct, one, explicitly speak to what we mean about being anti-racist? Hmm. Does it truly um, hold individuals accountable for behaviors, even off duty, right? When, These are changes you made this year? Yes. Yes. In 2020. Yes. When you think about it, we, we all shifted in the world to this remote work. And, you know, it's almost like social media became the virtual water cooler. So the lines are gray between, does that happen on work or off work? Is someone representing themselves? Are they wearing their badge on their, on their social media page? And we, we, we did not take that lightly. And we redesigned and reevaluated into a new statement, an equitable statement that addressed, it, that addressed misconduct and what we were not going to stand for and how we were going to be deliberate. And with what we call team member attestation, people have to attest to the fact that they recognize that this is important to us. Oh my goodness. So what what was the uh who needed to be involved in making this happen? Because one of the challenges I'm hearing about as part of my research is that oftentimes there is one loud passionate voice who is trying to arm wrestle their other executives or other leaders into making this happen. So yeah. first of all, was that your experience <laughs> and who needed to be involved in kind of making this very proactive change. Yeah. So one thing I, I do enjoy at Advocate of War is our intention and spirit around collaboration. It was a, it was a, it was a collaborative, I won't call us a motley crew, but it was a collaborative crew. And we had people from HR, from DNI, from legal, from risk. We had a leader from operations. Wow. We had um, uh, someone in finance to really say, Let's let's wrestle this through together. Everything from the implication of what could happen as a result of doing this. Oh, even our our, our public affairs and marketing team. Um, it, it was a really rounded out crew where we first just had the conversation. 
Like, what are we seeing? What do we need to do about it? We didn't go straight pen to paper, which I really appreciated. We didn't go say, let's author the statement, but we had the conversations first. And then we were able to then propose to our leadership. And I think our proposal coming from a place of collaboration and also from, we took the homework, took the time to do the homework outside to see what other organizations were doing in and outside of our industry. We were able to bring something forward that they say, we recognize and appreciate your leadership around this and to get their endorsement and support. It also requires, I think, some real vulnerability to say, despite, especially on your part, right, as the head of diversity, equity, and and inclusion, to say, what we've done thus far isn't enough. And so I want to collaborate and make this promise to do better. Like that takes massive vulnerability to say that out loud. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that, that's what makes this work, um, when it becomes challenging and becomes a weight, those moves refuel me. I want to come back to the kind of structural changes beyond the newest level of changes that you all have implemented this year. What are some of the kind of core principles that any organization needs to embed into their workforce strategy to make sure that they are appropriately elevating women and women of color into leadership positions? Yeah, I would say listening, <laughs> understanding, understanding your organization um, first. And I'll go back to something you said, Ray, about being transparent, being really open to the fact that we may uncover some things that really need our attention. Hmm. And it's not about asking for, you know, apologies, but it's saying this is the action we're taking forward based on what we know. Because one, once you know, you have to do something. Yeah. And I think that if it, it really starts with the mindset and that's, that's important because most people want to start with strategies. Let's build a strategy, you know, let's build a plan, let's build a program. But you, you've got to make sure that the mindset is in the right place. Otherwise, any strategy you, you, you try to implement will be, you know, short change will never be sustainable. And I also think it kind of comes back to what you were talking about with the the vital signs, right? Those matter when it comes to building your programs, but you also need to address things like succession planning and mobility and recruitment and what kind of flexible work arrangements do you have in your strategy in general in order to make progress, not just in these individual programs. Absolutely. Absolutely. If if you can raise things to be a strategic imperative where it becomes part of what's paid attention to in the business versus the separate initiative, then as my grandmother would say, then you're cooking with gas. (laughs) Do you have any kind of results of the program that you, or I should say the broader initiative that you'd like to share? How much have you been able to inflect uh, women and women of color at leadership positions? Absolutely. So our, our, our hiring rate of 49% uh, last year um, showed us that we were really, really moving the needle on increasing representation. Um, we set goals for ourselves uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and tied them to our incentive plans. That's a huge statement. Like we're mm, we're we're we're, we're that's committed a so change. much. That's a structural change. We're committed so much that you know your your summer boathouse money could be affected. <laughs> um, and and it also to me was a demonstration of shared ownership. You know, yes. the, 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 the joy I have, we have an impact report that we do each year. We've been doing for four years. And even this past year, even in the midst of, of pandemics, right, the things that we were able to achieve and the results and outcomes really tell the story of shared ownership. And that report is not the work of a single department, which is what I love. It, it's a story of multiple owners advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so that that really that really shows um, where when you make the investment, the things can really happen. One of the interesting parts to me of Advocate Aurora's story is that not that long ago, it was Advocate, one organization, Aurora, a separate organization. And then in 2018, went through a pretty major merger. And I can imagine that it can be quite difficult to link Things like culture, uh, some of these programs we've talked about, some of these structural practices that we've talked about when it comes to our DEI goals. What did being part of that merger teach you about how how to build a, a, a system that really benefits people? 
Yes, yeah, interesting. Is that if I look back at my career, so when I first came to Aurora, um, it was about building the program. The the work didn't exist, and then we encountered a merger, and um, I got to build again. Like that was exciting for me. My my, it's 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 crazy because um, I'm I'm like the the um, the handy woman in the house. <laughs> I love I love building stuff. My my dad used to used to do that with us together, and so my my son calls me Roberta the Builder. Um, so it was it was exciting to get to a place to say, what do we get to build now together for a larger geography and with a bigger team? You know, um, fundamentally, it was it was apparent that at the core of both of our organizations that this was a priority. And so we were able to assemble, whether it was formal programs or just personal interest, you know, across two geographies to say as a system, as a singular system, what will we go after and how will we make this impactful? And I imagine you could probably learn from each other. Like I imagined you being part of Aurora got to learn from the the hits and the misses of Advocate. Yeah. And vice versa. And being open enough to learn. Absolutely. And share what those things were with each other. Hmm. Beyond just reflecting on the past, I do want to give you a moment to talk about the future. When it comes to initiatives like the ones we've been talking about in this intersectional approach to advancing women in leadership, what is next for Advocate Aurora? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're we're not letting our, our you know our foot off on the gas on the work. Um, we're raising our attention and um, determination around health equity. And even as it relates to women, we think about things like maternal health, right? And we think about uh, behavioral health and access. Um, even just today, we had a live well session um, focused again for for Women's um, History Month around understanding and recognizing that women, you know, play such a key role in decision making in their households. And so, how do we provide that support? So, continued education, continued connection in the community but really looking at health equity in a broader standpoint and what interventions, not just from a clinical standpoint, but partnerships with communities can we do? What can we do differently to reimagine what healthcare looks like? How do we be proactive and think about wellness versus just sick care? Yeah. So I, I do see us on the horizon of, of raising the bar there. And to your point, diversity, equity, inclusion is a key feature, but just a feature of a broader health equity strategy. So it makes sense that those two things must be linked moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have obviously been a a leader at the forefront of this for for some time, but I want to ask you about the folks that maybe aren't living and breathing and thinking about DEI every day. What do you want to see from advocates or allies, especially Let's let's say it the the white male leaders who tend to make up the majority of uh, of leadership positions in the workforce. What is the role of them in advancing women and women of color in leadership? Yeah, I mean allyship is so important because it really means that um, someone wants to dive into the work and p- jump along and not observe. Yeah, you know, um, I think the best allies that I have are those who have and I say this often, who are authentically curious, that even when they recognize I may not be fully competent, but I, I'm curious enough to know how what can I do differently? And it starts from a very personal place. It's understanding, like there may be things that we all grew up learning that we need to shift our thinking on, right? Like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, maybe do unto others as they would have you do to them, you know, <laughs> because what I may desire may not be what another person desires, you know? And so I think allies who come from a personal place, allies who um, don't try to be anything but who they are, you know, you, you don't have to change who your identity or the things you listen to or, you know, what, what, what you watch. It's just a matter of saying, how do we co-design to at least make our circle of our world just a little bit different? And I also think it's interesting when allies allow diversity, equity, inclusion to to really get to other parts of their life. Like when I have an ally who says, I'm not just trying to learn for advocate or war, but can you help me understand with my children? Yeah. Right. Or, or, or this community organization that I'm a part of, or where could I volunteer? Um, opening themselves up for that kind of discovery is really powerful. 
I have to tell you, now that we are sort of at the end of Women's History Month, that one of the most frustrating things for me has always been to go to events that are about supporting women or about women in leadership. And I sort of look around the room. This was obviously much easier to tell in pre-pandemic days. Um, and I would only mm -hmm. see women. Right? I would only yeah. see people who looked like me or who identify with the challenges that, that frankly, I, I face as well. And, you know, we've talked about this on the, this podcast before, that if women or people of color could, could challenge the, 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 the systems around us and solve those problems ourselves, we would mm -hmm. have done it already. Yep. <laughs> we need more of these allies and advocates. But my question for you is, how do you actually get them? How do you actually push a group of, you know, white male leaders to be allies and ambassadors for their colleagues? Yeah. So can I be transparent? Yes. One thing I found that I wasn't even doing, I wasn't asking. I was expecting mm -hmm. and I was frustrated when they didn't. And I had um, some leaders that I was around that said, if you would only ask, right? Now, part of me is like, hey, you know what I'm trying to do here, right? J jump in. But I, th I think asking, asking very intentionally too. And, and with a strong why, like, I, I need you in this work, you know, and, and here's the thing, I need to learn from you as much as you need to learn from me. You know, there, there, there's little in the world that can be learned from, from one track, you know, discovery. And, um, and I think that's important. I also think of sharing with people that there's a lot of ways to learn, like your programs and your educational series and your webinars aren't the only place to learn about different, but going to an event watching a movie. You know, I, I've had leaders that have I've asked, hey, would you watch Selma with me? Mm. Or if you watch it, can we talk about it? You know, it, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the less, the, to me, those are lower risk engagements, right? Or seeing something on the news. What, what did you think? Can I share with you what I think? You know, we actually did that, a, kind of a, a mirror of that when we held these real talk sessions. Hmm. We had forums where people just, it wasn't a debate and it wasn't to, you know, fend for your view. It's just to make sure that you, your view was shared with someone else and, and their view was shared with you. Those provided, I think, a different kind of platform and a springboard for people to have open dialogue. I can't tell if you are giving advice to our listeners or you if you are literally just giving advice to me right now. <laughs> and possibly it's both. And that's okay. It's shared. It's shared. And to myself, too. <laughs> I want to give you a moment and and speak not to other leaders like yourself, not to other DEI leads, but actually directly to CEOs, right? To the decision makers across the healthcare industry. What do you want to see more from them when it comes to supporting workforce diversity efforts? Yeah. I would say please be open. <laughs> please be open and recognize that there is room for improvement for us all. I would reassure them that um, moving and shifting from current mindsets to new mindsets of inclusion does not make someone a label that they're a racist that need to change. And it's absolutely not the case. Can I jump in and say, by the way, I'm glad that you said that. I, I, uh, because I, I was speaking to a group of DEI leads the other day who literally called the word racism the R word, the word that they weren't allowed mm. to say at work. Mm. And I was like, oh yeah. my God, what a red flag if you can't say that. Uh, uh, so I'm glad that you went there. Yeah, that, that word makes a lot of people uncomfortable o on both sides, on all sides, <laughs> just to say that, you know, for it to be said or to hear it. Um, but acknowledging things need to be changed. The only thing that says is that you're a leader who's astute enough to know that you want to have a mindset of continuous improvement mm -hmm. to be, you know, and if, and I would ask leaders, you think about all the other places where you don't tolerate, um, enough, where you don't tolerate meeting expectations is going to make you win, where you don't tolerate doing just the status quo, like, and just transform that determination into the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would say, and then just find a partner who safely and privately um, can provide a safe space for you to stumble, who who, 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 hmm. who give you the grace and permission to to say the things you, that you that you may not be able to stay on platforms and stages and in talking points, you know, find an advocate. I mean, allies aren't just for the person of color, but the, it, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and find someone to discover that with, you know, you don't have to do this journey by yourself. Find, find another counterpart who can hold you accountable and, and to challenge you. Um, and, and be okay that all the metrics around this work aren't, excuse the pun, all, are not all black and white. There's, there's, there's measures around this that come with qualitative insight, that come with what's uncomfortable with ambiguity, but just try. Can I cheat and add one for CEOs also? Sure. Mine is to not put it all on the diversity equity inclusion officer or chief health equity officer. I think even as you're you're searching for that ally or that person to be vulnerable with, that also does not mean that you need to look to that person to teach you everything that you need to know about Absolutely. diversity equity inclusion or for for goodness sake, give them some more resources. <laughs> some more people. <laughs> exactly. To support this it, problem. It does. Yep, it, that's that people call the the the, the notion of black tax. That that's mm-hmm. a weight that's an unnecessary burden to place on people. And I think that tax can be labeled for any dimension of diversity. So don't get me wrong. Um but if you really want to grow the muscle, just think, you don't ask your personal trainer to do the reps. Ah. <laughs> the personal trainer advises you, supports you, guides you, challenges you, but if you're the one getting the muscle, they're not the ones lifting the weights. So that is such Just a good saying. analogy. That is such a good analogy. I'm going to shamelessly steal that. I know. I'm going to write that one down myself. <laughs> That's a good one. We talked about the vital sign. That one just dropped in my heart. So, <laughs> Well, Erica Joy, I want to thank you so much uh, for, for coming on Radio Advisory and having a really candid conversation about this problem that is, is top of mind for now, but we want to make sure it continues to be top of yes. mind even after yes. March is over. I do have one final question for you. It is the question that I I end every podcast with. And it's a chance for you to give kind of an action item to our listeners when it comes to advancing women and women of color into leadership positions. What's the one thing you want our listeners to focus on right now? Mm. I want them to know the gaps. I want you, if, if I could go back to my days of travel when we could... And in the UK, when you get on the, on the tube and it says, mind the gap, right? I, I just want people to mind the gap because people are stumbling because there is a gap. And if you don't mind it, um, there's just danger and risk. So I would ask everybody, just mind the gap. Know what the gaps are and address them. Yeah, I love that. Thanks so much for coming on Radio Advisory. Thanks for the invite. One more podcast to check off your, your, your bucket right. list here. <laughs> This was a good one. I enjoyed it. We'll be right back with what our research team is watching this week. Early last week, AstraZeneca reported phase three results as it begins the process of securing emergency use authorization. But after the NIH raised concerns about the data being potentially outdated, the company released updated numbers to account for additional COVID-19 cases that occurred near the end of the trial. For now, it's unlikely that the AstraZeneca shot will play a major role in U.S. vaccinations, especially across the spring and the summer. But there is some good news. President Biden announced plans to double his initial vaccine goal from 100 million shots in 100 days to 200 million. Meeting that goal is important because after the number of COVID cases fell rapidly in January and February, the numbers have plateaued, meaning we'll likely need expanded vaccinations and testing to bring case rates down further. Some states are considering expanding their Medicaid programs after Congress included a boost in the federal matching rate to incentivize expansion in the most recent coronavirus response bill. The additional money has some of the 12 holdout states reviewing their position. In Alabama, leaders are openly discussing the possibility of expansion. And in Wyoming, the Republican-controlled House approved a bill to expand Medicaid in the state. The bill still needs to pass the state Senate and get backing from their Republican governor. 
But it's notable that enough Republicans in the state house supported the bill at all and suggest the stimulus bill might be shifting politics around Medicaid expansion. Several of Biden's nominees for top healthcare jobs have been approved by the Senate. Javier Becerra was confirmed as Secretary of Health and Human Services, as was Dr. Vivek Murthy, who will be reprising his role as Surgeon General. Rachel Levine also received approval to become Assistant Health Secretary, marking the first time in history that an openly transgender individual received Senate confirmation, which I will also say is a great way to round out Women's History Month. With the team in seat, we may start to see a more comprehensive healthcare agenda take shape beyond simply responding to the pandemic. And when that happens, remember, we are here to help. Ray's breaking up for me. I'm assuming she is for you guys too. Yeah. And she's really getting yeah. going too. What? Uh, Ray. I know. <laughs> I'm very confident that we have the recording of you going on the rant that you just did, which is great. <laughs> but you need to you need to do it again so Erica Joy can react. So I can hear it. Yeah. I don't want to miss it. I am yeah. happy to do that. Okay. Okay, please. I will start over and get on okay. my soapbox right now. Okay. okay.